like guns? Well, I hope so. Welcome to the wonderful world of firearms and firepower. You're about to have a rare opportunity to see some of the world's most powerful and deadly weapons in blazing action. But before we get to the long guns, the silencers, and the full auto weapons, we're going to start with a look at a wide variety of handgun ammunition. We're going to be testing each of these pistols and several types of handgun ammunition to provide you with a visual comparison of the relative power of handgun ammunition. Why do we use the term power to describe handgun ammunition? Well, power really means one thing. The ability of the bullet to destroy human or animal tissue. While not a subject of much concern to target shooters, the power factor is of great concern to those in law enforcement, security, and to those concerned with personal defense. On the streets and in the bush, a bullet's power means one thing. Your bullet's ability to cause damage sufficient to prevent the bad guy from shooting back. We're not going to recommend a specific bullet or caliber. We're simply going to demonstrate the relative power of ammo types by shooting at a one gallon jug of water. There is one other important bullet characteristic you should consider, and that's the bullet's ability to penetrate. This is usually determined by the bullet's size and design. Let's take a look at some of the different bullet designs. There are solid bullets, some lead, some covered with a full metal jacket. There are hollow point types, and there are special frangible bullets like the shot shell or the glazer safety slug. The variety in bullet design results from the penetration factor. You want a bullet with sufficient penetration to pierce a man's coat, a leather jacket, or a wallet, but you don't want it to have sufficient penetration to penetrate through the body and come out the other side. That's why hollow points were invented. The idea of the hollow point is that the bullet upon contact will deform into a much larger shape. This will also create a more devastating wound and it will prevent the bullet from penetrating through the body. We're going to take a look at all these bullets in action in just a minute. I'm using a three-quarter inch pine board in front of the jug to simulate a bone or other hard material. Let's try it. Our first bullet will be the 22 long rifle. This is a 40 grain lead bullet fired from a Model 70S Beretta pistol. Let's see what it does. Good. Now we'll try it with a high velocity 22. This is a 22 hollow point with a State of velocity of about 1,500 feet per second. Now we're going to try the 25 automatic. Yes, 25 is a bigger number than 22, but the power of a 25 is much reduced from that of a 22. This is a 50 grain bullet at about 800 feet per second. This is a 32 auto, which is a very weak bullet. It's a 71 grain bullet, about 850 feet per second. We're firing it from a Walther. This is a full metal jacketed bullet. We'll see what it does. Now we're going to try a more powerful 32 round. The 32 silver tip. This is a 70 grain bullet at about 950 feet per second. Now we're into what is considered the minimum for a defensive weapon. This is a 380, which is also known as a 9mm short. 
we're firing a ball round, a full metal jacketed round, a 95 grain bullet at about 900 feet per second. Now we're starting to see some reaction from the water jug. We're going to use a 380 Supervel. This is a 88 grain bullet, jacketed hollow point at about 1100 feet per second. Nice. Now what you just saw with that Supervel 380 that was what I would consider a minimum defensive load. But now we're going to try something unique, the Glazer Safety Slug. This is a special bullet designed not to ricochet and not to penetrate, but to do maximum damage, as you will soon see. That was quite impressive with the 380 safety slug. Now we're going up to the 38 caliber, an old standby police caliber. We're going to use a 158 grain lead bullet at about 850 feet per second. The 38 and the 380 are not the same. It's a confusing use of numbers, but believe me, the 380 and the th and the 38 are quite different. That wasn't too impressive. A 38 special with 158 grain didn't do anywhere near as much as a safety slug in 380. But now we're going to use a more powerful 38 bullet, a jacketed soft point bullet. This is a 110 grain Supervel, which is about 1,250 feet per second. Now we're going to try the 38 Special Glazer Safety Slug. This is an even lighter bullet at 85 grains, going at much faster, about 1,400 feet per second. Now we're with the 38 Super. This is a 38 caliber bullet made for an automatic. It's a very powerful bullet. This is a full metal jacketed bullet, which is at 1150 feet per second, 130 grain bullet. Good. Now we're going to try the 9 millimeter full metal jacket. This is probably the most popular military cartridge in the world. This is a 123 grain bullet at 1125 feet per second. This is a 9 millimeter Supervel. It's a 112 grain bullet jacketed hollow point at about 1,300 feet per second. Now we'll try the 9 millimeter Glazer Safety Slug. Now we're going to use the 357 Magnum. This is a 158 grain bullet at about 1400 feet per second.
Now we're going to try the Supervel jacketed hollow point, 110 grain at about 1550 feet per second. Very powerful bullet. And now the 357 Magnum Glazer safety slug. This is an 80 grain bullet at about 2,000 feet per second. This will make a splash. Yep. This is the 45 ACP. One of the most famous rounds in the world, one of the most popular rounds in the world. It's a 230 grain bullet which travels at about 850 feet per second. Forty-five caliber silver tip. This is made by Winchester. It's a very popular police round currently. It's a 185 grain bullet traveling at about 970 feet per second. This is the Supervel jacketed hollow point in 45 caliber. This is a 185 grain bullet at about 1,000 feet per second. This is the Glazer 45 caliber bullet. It's about an 80 grain bullet at about 1,200 feet per second. It'll make a splash. This is a gun. To all you Dirty Harry fans, you'll recognize this. This is the Model 29, 44 Magnum, 8 and 3 inch barrel. Probably the most powerful handgun in the world. We're going to shoot a jacketed hollow point, 240 grain bullet, at about 1,400 feet per second. How about that? Well, now we're going to try the 44 Magnum Glazer safety slug, which is about a 168 grain bullet at about 1,800 feet per second. The old nickel-plated Model 29 will do the job. Yeah. We're going to try a 38 shot shell. This is a small plastic capsule filled with little tiny BBs, number seven shot. For some reason, there are a lot of people around lately who believe that this is a good defensive load. This bullet was designed to shoot birds or little critters you have a hard time hitting with a bullet. It is not an effective man stopper, and we'll demonstrate it. Nothing. I, I doubt if there's even. Oh, there's a little leak in there. Little, little bit of a hit. Certainly wouldn't stop a man, though. Let's even try it closer up. We've got one visible hole in it now. Here I am, about four feet away, directly on. 
we have a few more holes, but believe me, I would not use this to try to stop somebody with. This is a bird load. Use it for birds. Here's the uh, three-quarter inch pine board we had in front of the jug that we shot with the shot shell, a 38 shot shell. You notice that there was some leaking of the uh, jug, but that was from pellets that missed the, uh, the board. If you notice the board, there's no penetration at all. There's about, uh, oh, just dimples in there, maybe an eighth of an inch thick, eighth, eighth of an inch deep, if that. There's no penetration whatsoever. This would never penetrate a bone or even a, a heavy coat or a jacket. Don't use a 38 shot shell, please. Okay, we just shot all these jugs, as you saw. Remember, in front of each jug, we had a three-quarter inch pine board, which would simulate the uh, substance of a bone or a wallet or, or a thick coat. Uh, this is probably not as tough as a, as a sternum bone or a major bone in your body, but it is some obstacle to the bullet. We want to see if the bullet would expand enough to, to be stopped in the wood or penetrate through the wood and into the water jugs. Let's take a look at some of the water jugs. Start with the 22. 22 entered here, came out here. Not much power, went all the way through. Uh, we'll compare that with another bullet like the uh, 38, 158 grain lead. This is a very popular police round. Entered here, came out somewhere in here and split the, uh, split the jug. Now compare this 38 special to a 38 safety slug. 38 special safety slug. It entered here and did not exit. It just blew up the entire jug, split the jug. It used all its energy instead of exiting, exiting and carrying on, it used its energy to move the water around and just do a lot of damage. You can see a piece of the jacket still sticking out here. Let's take a look at some of the other calibers. We've got the famous uh, nine millimeter. Nine millimeter ball, full metal jacket. Entered here, came out here, split the case. Let's compare that to uh, 357 Magnum. 357, 158 grain lead, just a basic bullet. Entered here, and came out somewhere in here. Did quite a, bit, quite a bit more damage when you compare that to the nine millimeter. A lot more power. The 45 ACP, one of the most popular rounds. Entered here, came out here. Not too impressive. The uh, 45 safety slug entered here and then just split the entire jug into pieces. A bit more power. The 44 Magnum jacketed hollow point. Not much left to look at. Uh, entered somewhere, I'm not sure where it, entered or where it exited, if it did exit, but it destroyed the jug completely. What's there to learn from all this? Well, the most powerful bullet is the largest bullet with the highest velocity. That's pretty clear. But large caliber handguns recoil quite severely, which, for most people, makes them difficult to control, especially for the second shot. Large caliber handguns are also relatively heavy and difficult to conceal. So while the most powerful bullet is best, it is often not the most practical. You should use what you have just seen to consider the differences among different calibers and bullet types and decide for yourself. We've learned something about bullet power, but what about bullet penetration, practical penetration? We've taped a target inside this car. We're going to shoot through the door test penetration from a 357 Magnum. This is a Python six inch barrel. First bullet we'll be using is the full metal jacket. Now we'll take a look at the door. Well, there's no hit on the target, as you can see. There's no penetration through the interior. No hit at all. Next, we'll try a uh, higher velocity, but jacketed hollow point. 357 jacketed hollow point Superville. Ooh, a lot more powerful. Nasty hole there. And sure enough, we have a, uh, a hit. Actually, two, the bullet must have come apart. 
Now we'll try it with a 357 armor piercing KTW bullet. This, by the way, is famous as a cop killer bullet, which is a lot of nonsense because no policeman's ever been shot with it. The Teflon coating you may have heard about has nothing to do with penetration. Teflon coating is simply to protect the barrel because it's a very hard metal. Here we go. And we have a hole in the target, one nice hole. It did keyhole though, you can see it's not a round hole. It's kind of squared. The round went through there. It did not penetrate the other door. Next we'll try the Glazer safety slug. This is a special bullet, which is really not for shooting through doors, but we'll see what it does. But no hit on the target, no penetration through here, through the door. This is the area where it was hit. Yeah, right here. The bullet came apart inside, which is what it's supposed to do inside of a body, but no penetration through the door. Okay, next we'll try another caliber. I'll replace the target and try another caliber. Now we'll try 38 Special, favorite police load. We're going to fire it out of the same gun. As most of you know, a 357 Magnum and a 38 fire from the same gun. A 357 can fire both 38s and 57 Magnums. First one we're going to try is the 158 grain jacketed, full metal jacket bullet, standard bullet. And no penetration at all on the target. No marking here at all on the door. Nothing. No penetration. Next we'll try a 110 grain jacketed hollow point 38 Supervel. Very powerful bullet. But once again, well, we got a little dimple here. That wouldn't have, wouldn't hurt anyone. It did kind of break through right here. It probably threw out some piece of the molding here. But that's about it. Nothing effective. Essentially no penetration. No effective penetration. Next we'll try the 38 KTW armor piercing. And let's see what we got. No penetration. No penetration through. Last, we'll try 38 Glazer Safety Slug. So I doubt it will make through, but we'll try it. Whew, bigger blast. Oh, no penetration to target. So no 38 made it through the door. Now we'll try the 9mm. I'm going to replace this target, the other, the other one threw away, put a new one in there, and we'll try the 9mm. First round will be a 9mm full metal jacket, 115 grain bullet, standard military round. Take a look at it. Well. No penetration. We have a little dent here. Something came out and hit that, but nothing substantial at all. Next, we'll try the uh, 110 grain Supervel hollow point. Well, well we got a lot of junk here but nothing substantial, just a lot of pieces of junk. Well, here's part of the bullet sticking in the seat. Here's part of the jacket. 
I was just stuck in the seat. That wouldn't hurt anyone. I would make you jump, perhaps, but wouldn't wouldn't stop anybody from shooting back at you. Next, we'll try the 57, I mean, the 9 millimeter uh, KTW, armor piercing. <laughs> Blew the other window out. Must have gone all the way through. We'll see. Here we got one clean hole. It went clean through. 9 millimeter KTW went clean through and into the other door. I can't quite see if it, uh, where it hit, but it was powerful enough to jar the other door to, to uh, break the other window. Powerful. Last, we'll try the 9mm Glazer safety slug. Big hole again. <coughs> and we did get penetration on that. See that hole there? Penetration. That would have been enough to hurt somebody if the bullet stayed together that much. Here's where it came out. Replace our target. This guy's going to be in pain very soon. Because we've got the 44 Magnum. Six inch barrel. First round is a 220 grain jacketed, half jacketed solid bullet. What a blast. Entry hole here. No penetration in the target. Now the Remington 210 grain jacketed hollow point. Whew. That was a blast. No penetration. But we'll go on and we'll try the next one, which is the KTW 44 Magnum armor piercing. Still, no holes, no marks. Put the target a little further to the right this time. Find a cleaner place in the door. And now we're going to try the uh, 45. This is a 230 grain full metal jacket bullet first. Well, no penetration. Came out, it was in this area somewhere. No penetration at all. Next we'll try a 45 Supervel. 185 grain jacketed hollow point. Oh, look at that entry hole. You see how the bullet expanded in that. Good God. Amazing. I doubt if it penetrated with that kind of expansion in the sheet metal. No, once again, no penetration. Next, I've got the KTW, 45 KTW, armor piercing. Now there we got a penetration. Moderately clean hole. That was a good penetration. The last one we'll try is the Glazer safety slug. I'll try it below it. Mm, a lot of kick to that, I'll tell you. Big hole going in. But once again, no penetration. That's the same hole we had from the KTW. So we only had the KTW sneak through on the uh, 45 calibers. Just KTW. 
What does all this tell you about shooting at car doors? Well, to be quite frank, it doesn't tell you too much. Because inside a car door, you have a lot of different things. There's a reinforcing bar that goes across here. You've got the operator operating rods for the uh, windows. You've got the door handle mechanisms. There's all sorts of different areas in here. It's like a human body. Some areas are very soft. Some areas are very hard. Depends where you hit. What we're trying to show here is that there are a few bullets that, re that will reliably go through and penetrate a car door. With a handgun, you generally shouldn't shoot through a car door. That's really a lesson you should learn here. This is a 12-gauge shotgun, one of the most popular weapons in the world. A shotgun is a very versatile weapon as it can fire a wide variety of ammunition. Perhaps the most common type of shotgun ammunition is the birdshot shell, which is used in hunting ducks, pheasant, and other small animals. It comes in a variety of sizes. This is a number 10 shot, little tiny BBs. It is not very effective against humans at le unless fired at uh, close range. This is the double all buck round, which fires nine 32 caliber pellets, a very effective man stopper. This is the 12 gauge shotgun slug. The slug itself weighs either one ounce or one ounce and a quarter. It'll do a tremendous damage to man or animal. While the 12-gauge shotgun is a very effective weapon, most people don't realize that its range is quite limited when used with buckshot. This is a Remington 870 shotgun. It's a 26-inch barrel with an improved cylinder. I'm going to fire a double-O buck with nine pellets at each of these targets. The target ranges are 5 meters, 10 meters, 15, 25, and 35. These are the shotgun targets we just shot with the 12-gauge 00 buck. At 5 meters, we've got a nice pattern here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The large hole is caused by the, the uh, wadding inside the shotgun shell, as is this little dent. The large, this wadding wouldn't hurt anyone. We've got a nice group of 9 shots. We go to the 10-meter target, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Good center hit. A little bit high, but a good group anyway. Here we've got uh, 15 meters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine center hits. Be a good group. Now at 25 meters, we start to lose a little bit. We've got one, two, three, four, five center hits, and we've got six, seven, eight, and we lost one. Uh, 25 meters. Still effective. We go to 35 meters and there's a big difference. Here we've got one, two, three hits and one center hit. And here a peripheral hit. So we've got four total out of nine. We lost more than 50% of our pellets. The difference between the 35 and 25, you see that again. 25, 35. The point is at this range, you've lost your advantage with a shotgun. A shotgun is not effective at this range. At this range, you should use a pistol or a rifle. But what about penetration? I'm 10 meters from the car. We're going to use the 12 gauge 00 buck to try to penetrate the car door to hit the target behind it.
Well, here we've got a nice group. We've got our nine pellets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The glass was shattered, not by being hit by a pellet, but because of the concussion. Now, we'll take a look at the target. There's your target. No hits at all. There was no penetration. Look at the upholstery here. And we take a look, and I hit by a piece of glass, but there's no penetration through the upholstery. There's a little dent here from one pellet, but not very effective against the car door. Now we're going to try one ounce rifled slug. I'm going to fire two shots just to make it less of a random occurrence, and we'll try the door again. Okay, we fired that 12-gauge rifled slug, fired two shots into the car door, but they were a little too close together. And I'm afraid we're going to get confusing results. So I'm going to try it again. Here we have our four rifled slug hits. One here, one here, and these are the first two we fired, which is almost the same hole. Now we'll take a look at the target. <clears throat> well, we've got three distinct holes. This is the first one or the second one. I can't tell if it's one went through there or they both went through there or just where one was stopped inside the door. You have the second one here, third one, or excuse me, third one and fourth one here. Look at the inside of the door. <clears throat> we can certainly see the penetrations. We've got one here, one here. And this is where it was either one or two. But I've got a surprise for you. Well, here we are on the opposite side of the car, and we've got three clear exit holes. We'll take a look on the inside. And we notice we've got one, two, three, four holes here. So one shot did not penetrate all the way through. I found it sitting on the seat here, and there it is. Apparently bounced out of the uh, inside of the door, just rested on the seat. So we did have three penetrate completely through the car doors, both doors, and even one went through the seat. So what have we learned about the shotgun? It's a very powerful and effective weapon but its range and penetration are quite limited. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, because there are many times you might want to have a weapon that just has limited range and penetration, such as if you were firing from a, inside a house, in a room, you, do, you wouldn't want the rounds to penetrate into another room. Uh, you can't beat the shotgun for power operations, like blasting a door open. And as far as using a slug, sure, if you can hit someone with a slug, you'll do tremendous damage to them. But if you're going to use a shotgun like a rifle, why not use a real rifle? Some people suggest that you keep a slug round handy and you can convert the rifle, excuse me, the shotgun to a rifle whenever you need it by just adding the slug round. If you try to do that in a stressful situation, believe me, it's going to be nothing but fumble city. A shotgun should be used as a shotgun. There's no other weapon that can provide you with as much firepower at close range. And for that, the shotgun is superb. With rifles, we're not so concerned with power as we were with handguns. For rifles have plenty of power to stop somebody if you can hit them. There are two important things with a rifle. One is accuracy, your ability to put the bullet right where you want it, to hit someone. That's obvious. The other factor, which isn't often discussed, is a bullet's penetration. Because in real life rifle combat situations, you very rarely get a clean, clear shot at the bad guy. He's going to be hiding behind something like you are. So we're going to do a couple of tests today to simulate someone hiding behind such cover as brush, would be a tree branches, bushes, leaves, or someone inside an automobile. Will bullets penetrate through them? And with what effect? We'll find out 
These rifles represent, with one exception, modern combat rifles used by armies and law enforcement agencies around the world. First is the AR-15 or M-16. This happens to be a civilian version, a semi-automatic version of the M-16, which is in, currently in service with the United States Armed Forces as well as the Armed Forces of many other nations. This is a civilian version of the AK-47. It's made in Finland. It's called a Valmet. It fires the same round as the AK-47. This is the finest battle rifle in the world, in my opinion, the FN-FAL. It fires a 308 NATO round, and it's in, currently in use in about 90 different countries around the world. Very, very popular weapon. This is probably familiar to a lot of you people. Is a 30, cal uh, 30 caliber carbine. This was originally developed and used in World War II, and it's still in service uh, throughout the world. This is not really a rifle. This is a carbine. However, we're going to use this to compare the effects of this type of bullet against the effects of modern combat rifles. What we're going to do is first we're going to do some testing against light brush. We have small branches, leaves, and twigs, none thicker than about a half inch, stacked up in front of the target, which is three feet behind. A cardboard aiming card will be set up in front to determine exactly where the bullet hit. These are the four bullets we're going to be testing. First is the 762 by 51 NATO round, which is a 147 grain bullet which goes at 2,680 feet per second. The 762 refers to the diameter of the bullet, 51 the length of the case. Next we have the 223. This is a 55 grain bullet at 3,200 feet per second. It's used in the AR-15 or the M-16. Then we have the 762 by 39, which is a 122 grain bullet at 2,300 feet per second. This is a round found in the AK-47 uh, in use by Soviet countries and other communist countries and terrorists around the world. Then we have a little fellow here, which is the carbine bullet, 30 carbine. It's a 120 grain bullet at 1,900 feet per second. We're going to test all of these bullets against the same type of objects to give you a visual comparison. This is the AR-15 which fires the same bullet as the M16, it's almost an M16, 223. And we're going to test it against this brush. This is the target I just shot twice with a 223 through the brush. Now in front of the target I have a small piece of cardboard as an aiming point. This is in front of the brush. If you notice here, the holes in this are nice and round, the way they're supposed to be. You can compare these with the holes in the target, which are quite different. If you notice, it matches exactly the shape of the bullet, sideways. What happens is that the bullet hit some of the brushy branches there and tumbled, started spinning around and went through here sideways. Now would this still hurt someone behind, hiding behind that brush? You betcha it would, but there'd be no accuracy. If you were shooting at someone way beyond that brushy uh, area that you're shooting through, you'd never hit them. The bullet would have no more accuracy because it's spinning. Remember one thing, a lot of people for some reason believe that bullets tumble in flight. Bullets do not tumble in flight, but they're not supposed to tumble in flight when they come out of a gun. They tumble when they hit, perhaps, when they hit the, hit the body or hit some brush, but they don't tumble in flight. So what we have here is the 223, a very light bullet, just clipping some of those little branches out there, and that was enough to start them tumbling. Now we're going to try the Russian round, the 762 by 39 out of a Valmet which again is a civilian version of the AK-47. 
Two shots. Here's our 762 by 39. You see one round went through straight, one round completely went through sideways. You notice the front plate here. I shot about like this. And notice the, the distance between these two hits. Now, when I take this away, you see how that bullet, the bottom bullet, went through, tumbled, and went in a completely different direction. It's probably going up for a while. So the point is, if someone was hiding directly behind the brush, they'd be in big trouble, even though the bullet tumbled. But if they weren't, if they're further away, the bullet would have missed them. This bullet would have. This bullet may not have hit any brush. It may just have just touched a couple of branches or real light ones. We don't really know. This is the 308 NATO, or 762 by 51, fired from a FN. I'll fire two shots. <clears throat> And now let's take a look at that target. Well, let's take a look at that. Thank you. Here's the head. Here's our 308 bullets, 762 NATO. And you can clearly see that they, they tumble also. Um, which shows you that any bullet, any bullet can tumble when it hits a brush. Here's the entries, which is actually this way, and that's what happened through the brush. So not only do 223s tumble, 762s by 39s tumble, but 308s can tumble too. Now we'll try the 30 carbine. Here's our 30 caliber carbine target. Notice also the bullets have tumbled once again. This is a cartridge with the bullet head, and this is the actual bullet. You notice here the size. Is, I wanted to show you the relative size. It's quite a bit smaller. That's why the holes are sort of odd shaped compared to the other ones. But they tumbled just as well. Here's the entry holes. Entry hole here, and it's just grazed the top of that one there and tumbling underneath. Went through the brush, hit something, caused the bullet to tumble. Uh, this, what we saw here is that all the calibers tumbled. Does it mean that a bullet will always tumble? No, it doesn't. It depends on what it hits, how it hits it. But what you can be sure of is that a bullet is capable of tumbling. And if you're firing at someone who's far beyond the brush, you probably won't hit him if your bullet tumbles. Just for fun, we're going to try as a comparison, the basic 45 with the uh, 230 grain full metal jacket, hardball ammunition. Let's see how that makes it through. Here's the 45 ball, which one in here, you see there's two holes right there, very close together, and you can see the spread, how they, they did tumble. They hit the wood and they also tumbled. These are not standard 45 entry holes. A standard 45 entry hole is a nice concentric round hole. So it also tumbled. Next we'll be trying something a little more interesting. You notice the difference in sizes. We get up to this. This is a 50 caliber bullet, which you're going to fire out of a 50 caliber rifle. This is Bruce MacArthur, Bruce MacArthur. And Bruce, you built this gun out of scratch? Yes, I did. It's a 50 caliber rifle. How much does it weigh? 34 pounds. 34 pounds. How, how far can you shoot with this thing? Now, the range of the projectile is four miles. Accuracy is about 1,800, 2,000 yards. Good God. What kind of accuracy do you get at 2,000 yards? I've never fired it that far. What's the furthest you ever fired it? Uh, 500's been the furthest, and I can get about 3-inch groups at 500. Amazing. Well, you think you can penetrate that brush? I'll give it a try. Okay.
fire again. No. Here's our 50 caliber target, and much to my surprise, the bullets also tumbled. Here's how they went in, they went through the brush, came out that way. This is a 700 grain bullet, an enormous bullet, tremendous power. But even that was deflected slightly by the uh, little branches we have set up. What's the conclusion? All bullets are capable of tumbling, even with light brush. It's something you should remember. This is standard quarter inch plate glass, the type commonly found in any store window. We're going to see if firing a rifle bullet through the plate glass will deflect the bullet significantly. The glass has been placed at a 20 degree angle to the bullet's path. This is the glass we shot through. The glass was placed at about a 20 degree angle behind at about 8 feet with the targets. This is a standard plate glass that you'd find in any store window. The first one was a 223, which I was aiming for about here. Hit here, it keyholed. It was not a straight through hit. And notice the little marks all around. This is little pieces of jacket we determined later on and little pieces of glass perhaps, but mostly jacket. The point is, with a 223, if you're aiming at someone behind the glass, you probably would have hit him. Even though the rounded key hold, you'd probably hit him. Let's go to the next one. The 7.62 NATO also was pretty accurate. You would have hit somebody behind there. You can see some little pieces of jacket here all around. Not bad. We'll go to the next one. This is the 762 by 39, the 762 Russian with the AK-47 round. Now you see all those holes? That was actually one bullet. What happened is that apparently this is a very cheaply made bullet because the jacket separates from the lead core very easily. And I think this is where the bullet went, the lead bullet, perhaps. And the rest of the stuff is pieces of jacket that went through. The jacket wouldn't be enough to really damage anyone. It would cut you up, but it really wouldn't put anybody out of action. Where the bullet probably would still have enough power to do so, quite certainly. And also, notice the deflection on that. It went a little, quite a bit higher up here after it hit the glass and came apart. Then we go to the 30 carbine. Now, it looks like there are two bullet holes in there. It's actually one bullet, and you notice I was aiming for this area. The bullet deflected up here and burst into at least two parts, perhaps a jacket and a bullet. We have two distinct holes here. So the point being in this one, with a 30 carbine, you probably would not hit what you were aiming at behind the glass, depending on the size of the target, of course. But we found some very interesting things, mainly that the, uh, the glass is hard enough, even just a quarter inch of glass, to separate a bullet from its jacket. Shooting through glass at 20 degrees. Now, you can imagine shooting straight on, you'd probably have more or less the same effect. If we can shoot quite accurately as we did, sh at shooting at a 20 degree, degree angle, shooting straight on should present no problem with accuracy, but it will keyhole the bullet and strip the bullet of its jacket. Now let's try shooting through laminated glass, a car windshield. A windshield is a lot tougher than plate glass and is almost invariably at a sloping angle. Let's see what rifle bullets will do.
Here are the results of our auto windshield test. We shot at targets which were simulating passengers in the front seat of a car. We shot through the windshield at about 40 meters. First one was a 223. You notice the numerous perforations. What happened, I was aiming about here. The bullet struck here. The jacket was stripped from the bullet. We found pieces of jacket all through here on the other side. The bullet still had sufficient power to penetrate through the front seat into the back seat, and it probably stuck somewhere in the, in the trunk. But it was sufficient enough to go through the windshield and hit somebody, and it was quite accurate. Now we'll try the <clears throat> 308. Notice the two holes, two distinct holes. This is about where I was aiming. I moved my point of aim so I wouldn't hit the same hole. And we had two holes there. It was also the jacket being stripped from the bullet. Once again, this bullet had sufficient power not only to go through the back of the front seat, but through a bulletproof vest we had. Well, a, we had a, a bulletproof vest which is designed to stop pistols. And we thought it would, it would stop the fragments, but it had, it had quite a bit of power. Went quite all the way through it. <clears throat> this is the 762 by 39 the AK-47 round. Uh, the accuracy, you can't quite tell from the target itself because you don't know where I was aiming, but I can tell you the accuracy was, was okay. I was aiming at about this area, but notice how the keyhole, severe keyholing here, here and here. The bullet just complete, completely came apart. It did have uh, quite a bit of power still left in it probably. Uh, to penetrate, it penetrated through a, another layer of vest we had there, but it, it just disintegrated virtually. The, the, the jacket was stripped from the, from the body. 30 carving. Once again, we have two holes, and this one we, we worked at and recovered the pieces, and we found the, uh, the bullet, which is a piece of lead which I think went through this hole. And we also found the jacket. This is the stripped jacket. It's just mushroomed out and stripped. This is a 30 carbine. Now the 30 carbine actually deflected quite a bit from where I was aiming. So, and this stopped very easily in the, in the vest. Just for uh, interest, we also decided to try a 45 pistol, 45 ACP pistol, and this is the results we got. <clears throat> it penetrated through the window and hit uh, very accurately at the point of aim. It did keyhole, though. It did change. You can see from here, this is not the way a 45 bullet should look, a bullet hole should look. The bullet did keyhole and go through with sufficient force to injure someone. So the conclusions in this... I have to say that the, uh, the windshield didn't stop any bullet. Uh, it didn't deflect any bullet sufficiently to make the bullet ineffective. The bullets went through and still hit hard enough to do damage. This is an AR-15 firing a 223 caliber bullet, 55 grain. We're going to try it against the car door. Let's pretend we're in Beirut trying to stop a car bomber. The 223 bullet virtually disintegrated inside the door. Only a few fragments of the bullet and the jacket made it through. The 223 was not effective. This is all that penetrated through from the 223. We have a vest behind the target and that's all that made it to the vest. Pretty sad. That would not enough to hurt anybody at all. That's the bullet we started with. That's what we ended up with. Totally ineffective. If that were a terrorist, suicide terrorist in a car with explosives, the 223 bullet would not have stopped him with that car, with that door, with that shot. 
Um, frankly, I wouldn't trust a 223 in a car door. Let's try a 308. The 308 penetrated the door completely. The bullet continued on and went through both sides of the vest and out the other door. The 308 full metal jacket was very effective. This is the Valmet, the semi-automatic version of the AK-47, firing a 762 by 39 bullet. We'll try it on the door. The Soviet 762 by 39 didn't do too well. Pieces of the bullet penetrated the door and went through only a portion of the vest. Marginal effectiveness. Thirty caliber carbine, World War II favorite, firing 120 grain bullet, full metal jacket. See how it does. The 30 carbine bullet came apart in the door. Only a small fragment made it to the surface of the vest. Not at all effective. Let's see what 100 rounds of 45 from a Thompson submachine gun will do to a door. Well, this is what uh, 100 rounds, 45 ACP from the Thompson did. Looking here, I can only see about 30 or 40 holes, but you've actually fired 100 rounds, so you got a real tight group. Some went through. I can't open the door, but I'll show you the target. We've got quite a few holes in the target. It's hard to see. Um, not all the rounds penetrated through. It's hard to tell how many did and how many didn't, but probably uh, a third or a half of them penetrated through. Pretty devastating. Aren't you glad you weren't sitting here? This is John Powers, who's a master machinist, who's made a lot of amazing things. This is one of them. What's the range of this piece? Depends how good a shot you are. If you're real good, 2,000 yards. 2,000 yards. Oh, no. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we don't have 2,000 yards. What we're going to do is we're going to try this just for the Downing Thomases. We're going to try this against the car. You saw some other things penetrate a car. We're going to see if the 50 caliber will penetrate the car. You ready to do it? Sure. Here's our 50 caliber hole. It went into the door. It came out of the door, went through the target, of course. I have a surprise for you. It also went through <laughs> this heavy half inch piece of steel. So you can imagine that it also went through the other side of the door, which it certainly did. It came out, and God knows where it ended up. 50 caliber. You'll have no problem going through a car. You're looking at a fuel tank, a standard vehicle fuel tank. It's filled about a quarter filled with gasoline. Now, you've all seen movies in which they shoot at cars and the cars blow up into a big ball of flame. Now, we're going to shoot right at the gas tank so we know we hit it. Let's see if we can set it on fire. We're going to use ball, 
standard 308 ball, and we're also going to use ball, uh, 308 tracer. Let's try the ball first. Two shots. Okay, now we're going to put uh, two tracer rounds in it. I didn't see any flash of smoke out there. Thank you. We'll try some tracer rounds. Well, I think you could probably see the flash from the tracer going in there. But if you look out there, the gas is pouring out and nothing's happening. We'll turn to the tracer. I'd say tracer is not too effective in starting a gas tank on fire. Just for the heck of it, we're going to try 223 tracer. We tried 308 tracer, it didn't do anything. We'll try a couple of these, two rounds. Nothing happening. So much for Tracer. Now, I know some of you watching out there were really looking forward to seeing that gas tank explode. Well, we don't want to disappoint you, maniacs. So we've set up two containers of gasoline, which are guaranteed to go up in a big ball of fire. Just watch. Well, Rich, that sure is a big one you got there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, what the hell is that? Uh, it's a pair of earmuffs. You put them over your ear so you don't get it, their eardrums hurt when you're firing big guns. Oh. Big guns, in fact, like this oh. 50 caliber rifle here of mine. Uh, this actually is a, originally a Mauser. It says Mauser 1918 on this. The serial number is 277. It was originally in a 13.2 millimeter. Uh, 50 caliber is 12.7. So the original cartridge for this was sort of a short, fat 50 caliber. Slightly less energy than today's 50 caliber, but in World War One it was designed. It would hit a early tank which had about a one inch plate steel in front of it, which was good enough to stop even a 30 out six armor piercing. But this big old thing would just hit that one inch plate of steel, go crashing through. So a big big hunk of lead going about a thousand feet a second, and a big piece of steel going bouncing around inside the tank until it hit some until it hit something soft. I was corresponding with a writer from England who had inquired in a gun magazine about anyone who had these old rifles, these Mausers. This was the first model anti-tank weapon ever made. And it turns out that in the Enfield Royal Arms Museum in Enfield, England, there's a gun similar to this with a serial number 300 something and a sign that says, world's oldest known anti-tank weapon. Well, this being serial number 277, the English writer wrote back, who's doing a book about these, says, God blimey, and uh, looks like you've got the oldest known anti-tank weapon in the world this particular gun right here. Uh, someday I'll go over to the Enfield Arms Museum and spray paint in their second oldest. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to oh, fire oh. a uh, 50 caliber, unusual round. This is a style of a Glazer safety slug. It's uh, a hollow bullet completely filled with uh, number six lead shot in, suspended in oil. And we'll fire it into this uh, gasoline with a burning torch behind it and see what kind of reaction we get. Now, if you watch real closely on tape, let me get set. Let me tell you set, Richard. Don't shoot until we say so. Get the camera. Get down Don't the shoot until we say so. Okay. You're going to shoot. It didn't say so. bulletproof vest designed to stop rifles. It was created by a man who had a lot of intelligence and a hell of a lot of courage because he was the first man to ever test concealable 
soft body armor. And that's Richard Davis. Come on out here, Rich. Mm -hmm. Big hand for Rich. Clap, yeah. clap, clap, clap. <laughs> okay. Tell me about this vest. Uh, well, this one, as you can see, it worked in rehearsal. Uh, <laughs> this is Second Chance Hardcore 3. It's sort of a go anywhere, do anything type vest. Uh, you can take the pad out of here and put it inside a deep cover shirt. You've got a rig similar to this where you can put it on, wear it concealed, goes through airport metal detectors. It's sort of the Soldier Fortune model. We have a Hardcore 2, which is smaller and real cheap. I call it the Peruvian Private model. And we have a Hardcore 4, which is bigger, comes from here all the way down below the groin. And that's That I call the World War I model, in that 10,000 men come out of the trenches and go against machine guns. You want to have that on. This is sort of the basic uh, compromise all around. This is for rifles. For rifles. There's no vest that is totally bulletproof. And on the other hand, there's no bullet that can't be stopped. Uh, this is designed right here. will take a uh, 30 caliber rifle. This vest as Alex is wearing right now will indeed stop a 458 Winchester Magnum. However, today Alex is uh, first time for him here, so he's a little nervous, but we'll just hit him with a 308 NATO ball rather than a 458. We've got uh, five rounds in here just to show you what, what we got. Upstairs. I'm just going to fire here in the, in the dirt. I'll fire four. I'll leave one. You got one left. You know where do you want to put that? Yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Carefully, please. Okay. I'll put my glasses on so I don't get any blasts in my face. Show you the confidence I got in uh, in Richard and his vest. Okay, you got your hands behind your back. Yep. Notice how he's standing with it. Uh, he's not all hunched forward like this. The impact of a rifle bullet will not knock you over. Well, that's one of the things I want to show you. That's, okay. that's true. Thanks for reminding me. Alex is uh, leaning back on his heels here. I'm going to stay at one foot. What? Well, <laughs> can you juggle while we do this? I'll just say, well, I can't hold my foot up that long, but okay. a bullet does not knock you down. Your reaction to the bullet knocks you down. We in okay? Yep. Okay. Let's try and get it right. There it is. Really didn't feel like much. Much less than a punch. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, folks. There's hardly any blow to it all. If you think about it, the physics involved, the, the energy received can't be more than the energy transmitted, which means if the bullet had enough power to knock you down, it would also knock down the man firing it. So there's not much to it. Uh, what happens is, just as Richard once pointed out, if you come up and stick somebody in the ass with a pin, the guy's going to jump into the air. It's not the force of the pin, it's just your reaction to it. When you're shot, it, upset, it upsets you. It may hit your nerves, you may jump into the air. I can show you here. Where did that hit exactly? I don't see. Right here. Yeah. Right here. Enjoy shit. Uh, we'll, 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 cut, we'll take it apart after. I think you know that it didn't penetrate, or I wouldn't be standing here talking. <laughs> run like 40 miles an so hour. So what are you going to do with this stuff? Oh, God, i got to do that. Uh, okay, basically this is a soft second chance. And I'll say to police uh, I'm doing this for is that uh, I've got to do this maybe twice a week, and you guys do it once every 20 years. <laughs> So what I use here, instead of, I don't have any metal inserts in a soft vest here, but we uh, resort to using some magazines just to take the shock out of it, because if I didn't do that, my chest looked look like a piece of raw hamburger, and I don't get to kill anybody afterwards either. Uh, this is the uh, fairly stiff load. This is the Federal three-quarter jacket, 44 Magnum. It's a 220 grain bullet, and you see the jacket comes up and around there. We'll stuff six of these buggers in here. No point to my fingers leave my hands. And we'll spin the cylinder. Better hope this thing works, I guess. It's an ugly pimple you have there. Yeah. These vests cost for roughly $300 a piece. We can, uh, let's have a discount on this one. <laughs> I got the magazine. Let's get the magazine up here. Whoa. Magazine doesn't even want any part of this stuff. And to dispel a myth of multiple hits, we're going to let the round go right about here, maybe. Uh, same area as uh, this previous 44 Magnum was. That was the last demonstration. Like I said, I do this for a living. Very hard on these shirts, but I get them free where I work. <laughs> Where's that, Rich? <laughs> Boy, I hate that. Anyway. Love it. 
looks like a little bit pregnant there. Anyway, again, the vest would not puff up that much in real life here with the, with the shirt holding it down or anything. But the real purpose of the magazines is not to stop the bullet, right? Yeah, the magazine didn't stop the bullet. The, the vest itself stopped it. It's just it's to just prevent you from the, uh, getting all carved up inside. Right. Big bruise. Ah. Rich, I'd like you to yeah. shoot me again one time. I want to carefully balance that one foot to prove the point about the bullet not knocking you over. Mm -hmm. Got a crazy man here. That, uh... <laughs> Got in on my act, you know. <laughs> <laughs> now be careful. Magazine lashing out a little while. Okay, one around. NATO ball. It's out of there. What the heck? Uh, I want to balance that one foot. Okay, I'll shoot you right here and. Okay. Okay, so you get a good gang on that. He's on got, one on, foot. got on balance on one foot. Yep. Okay. Nothing to it. <laughs> Just a lot of fluff. Looks like fun, doesn't it? Well, rocking and rolling on full auto is a lot of fun. But that's about all it is. In a real combat situation, going full auto like that is nothing but a waste of time, a waste of ammunition. I'll show you what I mean. As an example of fully automatic fire. I've got a rifle here with 20 rounds loaded. I've got five bad guys down there. Now in the movies, if you have five bad guys charging the hero, he would stand here, put this gun on full auto and spray the area. All five would fall down and die. Well, in real life, it doesn't work that way. Full auto fire is very hard to control, very, very hard to, to fire accurately. I want to give you a demonstration. I've got a timer here, which will time me and it will stop on my last shot. Let's see how long it takes. I'm going to try my best to hit those five targets with 20 rounds. Let's take a look at the targets. Well, here's my one hit. Out of 20 rounds, I got one peripheral hit. I tried hard to hit all those targets. That's the best I could do. I got one hit out of 20 rounds on five targets. Now, I'm going to try something else. I'm going to try with 20 rounds. Well, I'm going to try to hit the target once each. One shot, one hit. Let's see how that works. Put it on semi-auto. Start my timer. Now we'll take a look at the target. Four point four two seconds. That's not bad for five well aimed shots, as opposed to just under three seconds for twenty shots, which provided only one marginal hit. I'd much prefer to have five good hits, five dead bad guys, than one slightly wounded bad guy and me with an empty magazine. Sure, f firing full auto was a lot more fun. You feel like Sergeant Rock, you make a lot of noise, a lot of blast, kick up a lot of dust, but I'd rather have the hits. Slower, controlled fire is much more effective than full auto fire. I'll give you another demonstration. Now we've moved the center target quite a bit closer, about 25 meters from here. I'm going to fire on full auto a three round burst. I'm going to hold on the center of the target and fire three rounds and we'll see what result I get. Now I'll take a look at the target.
Here is the target I just shot at about 25 meters with a three-round burst from the FN. I've got one hit. This is just a staple mark. I aimed here, pulled the trigger, one went in here, the other two went up here somewhere as, a, as the muzzle climbed up. I hope you remember all this next time you think about firing full auto. Full auto should not be fired from a rifle in most situations. It's a specialized use for various things which we won't go into but for general hitting your target don't go full auto one shot one hit well after doing this test with the target at 25 meters with a three round burst on full auto these four people our entire crew wanted to try it themselves this is ranging from beginner to advanced shooters none of them could do it even little Gary Morgan there our best boy tried firing at the dirt the first shot his second shot hit here somewhere and the third one went over the top. Everyone tried real hard, even Bruce Gray. They couldn't do it. Three round bursts at 25 meters, they can only get one round on the target. Remember that. If you read the paper or watch TV news, you probably heard about the 357 Magnum, the bullet so powerful it can penetrate an engine block. That's what they tell you on TV. I've heard this so often, I think they teach it in journalism school. It's an absolute bunch of nonsense, as we'll soon find out. Here is an engine block. From about three feet away. So much for the going through an engine block with a 357 Magnum. All we have here is a little mark, a little indentation on there. That was a 150 grain full metal jacketed bullet. We'll try it with something a little more penetrative. There it is, just a little mark on the wall here. No Denting, no penetration whatsoever. So much for the police bullet which can go through an engine block. Next time you hear that stuff on TV, you know the truth. We also should keep in mind that if the press can't get this little bit of technical data straight, you should think more than twice when they discuss more complex issues like nuclear energy or the MX missile. Perhaps the most exotic weapon component of all is the silencer, or more properly, the suppressor. I'll tell you why that's a better definition in a minute. The job of the suppressor is to make a gun quieter, to reduce the sound of a gunshot. And it does that by internally having a set of baffles and an expansion chamber in this particular model, which absorbs some of the energy of the gas here, and here it retards the the speed of the gas. And the gas escaping uh, is what makes a lot of the noise. Now, a suppressor, this may look big to you, but this is about what you need for an effective suppressor for a 45. You've probably seen movies, Hollywood loves su suppressors, or they call them silencers. Generally, their suppressors or silencers are about uh, the size of a cigar tube, about half that size, much smaller than this. It's all nonsense what you see in the movies. They're not effective at all, and what's even more ridiculous is that for some reason Hollywood seems to prefer putting suppressors on revolvers. A suppressor on a revolver will not work hardly at all, because in a revolver you have a gap here between the cylinder and the barrel. Some gas comes out here normally, and when you put a suppressor on the end, it increases the pressure up here, which increases the amount of gas coming out here and increases the noise. Why Hollywood continues to show a uh, Revolvers with silencers on them, I, I don't know, but uh, it's just another technical inaccuracy. Getting back to a real suppressor, suppressor can be used effectively only on certain rounds, certain calibers, because if a bullet is faster than the speed of sound, it will create a sonic boom itself. So you either have to use like a 45, the bullet 
of which the bullet is subsonic, or if you're going to use a caliber like a rifle caliber, you have to download the ammunition, make it specially so it won't go faster than sound, if you want the maximum effect. Uh, we're going to demonstrate just so you can see just how quiet a silencer is. If you never had a chance to uh, see a real, or hear a real suppressor in action, you're, you're about to. But I hate to disappoint to people who watch a lot of TV, it's going to be a little bit louder than that you hear in the movies and on TV. We'll try it. Here's a suppressor. Here's what the sound sounds like. 45. It's loud. You notice it also. I don't know if you could notice, but it did not work the action. It did not eject the shell. Because of the gassing, the gas porting in here, it takes a lot of the energy out of the bullet and the barrel is held on to this, to this thing and it can't move back and forth and I have to work it by hand. So it would be a single shot weapon, but you wouldn't go around hosing down an area with this thing anyway. Now we'll fire one without the suppressor. You can hear the difference. A whole lot louder. Put this back on for another comparison. Here we go. A lot more pleasant to the ear. This is the Ingram M10 45 caliber submachine gun with a suppressor. And doesn't that look like a bad guy to you over there? It sure does to me. Ah, nothing like it. Nothing like it. That was 30 rounds in one and a half seconds. Real firepower. This is a Ruger 1022 made by the old Military Armaments Corporation. It's got a suppressor, an integral suppressor on it. It's probably the most fun gun there is to shoot because there's no kick being a 22, and there's very little noise. You probably get as much noise from the clacking of the bolt as you do from the bullet. I'll demonstrate this thing. First, I'll fire a 22 Ruger without a suppressor. We'll hear the difference. Here's without a suppressor. And here's with a suppressor. Now that's quiet. That is really quiet. What's nice about this is you can fire from a 10 round magazine, you can put them all with the scope, you can put them all in one area. Bang, 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 bang. No noise, or very little noise. It's a real beauty. This is a pistol that's often shown in uh, movies, TV. It's a Ruger. This is also modified by Military Armaments Corporation. Um, it's not quite as quiet as you think it is, but we'll, we'll show you here. Um, that would get your attention. That's a far cry from chuk, chuk, chuk. But it's, it's a lot quieter than not having one. Now for some fun stuff. This is the Ingram M10 45 submachine gun with a suppressor. Now, this is on full auto. Safety is off. Watch what this sounds. Here we go. 30 rounds. It's also a lot of fun. <laughs> we have other suppressors for rifles. This is a AR-15 or M16 with a suppressor. Now this suppressor reduces the sound considerably, but it's still a very loud noise. These were used in, uh, in Vietnam quite a bit. I think they're still in use by the armed forces. What it does is it, it doesn't make it possible to shoot somebody in a crowded bar without someone noticing it, but it does allow you, if you're in the woods or in the jungle, to shoot without the sound of the gunfire going, say, five miles or whatever it would travel. It would probably go, oh, a fourth or uh, maybe even a fifth of the distance. So it just keeps your sound level down. Also, we call it suppressors 
gentleman's accessories because it, with using a suppressor, you don't need to wear ear plugs or ear muffs to protect your ears. We'll demonstrate this. Okay, here's a 223 with a suppressor. Full auto, too. Now I'll fire a single shot so you can hear the difference. There's one shot. Now I'll fire one from a standard AR-15. Same ammunition. Listen to the difference. Quite distinct. This one's painfully loud if you're not wearing earplugs like I am. That one is comfortable to shoot. It's a heck of a difference. That's why we gentlemen prefer suppressors. Here are two 22 caliber long rifle bullets. This is a standard velocity. It's just under 1,100 feet per second. This one's about 1,500 feet per second. Now what we're gonna demonstrate with this is that this one does not quite break the sound barrier, and this one does. I'm gonna fire one round of this and one round of this type through the suppressed weapon, and you'll hear the difference. Okay, first will be the subsonic round, the standard velocity round, which is just under the speed of sound. Listen carefully. A little ricochet out there. Now, we'll try the supersonic round, high velocity round. You heard the sonic boom out there. That was the crack of the bullet breaking the sound barrier. Wasn't that much difference in noise here but out there, it's a quite a bit of difference. That's the difference between the suppressed round, excuse me, the subsonic round and the hypersonic round. That's why it, uh, suppressors are only effective with rounds which are subsonic. This is a very special briefcase. It's a bit more than an ordinary briefcase. So we open this up and surprise, we have an M11 with a suppressor ready for action. Out here, where you have a card, there's actually a hole where the bullet will come out of. Look at that. Without opening it, you can just reach your hand under here, pull the lever, and fire the weapon. Well, hello there. I'm just an ordinary businessman on his way to work with his little briefcase. And then I can hold it up like this. If I see somebody I know, like, oh, there's Comrade General over there. Let's say hello to Comrade General. Hello, Comrade General. <laughs> You're going about your business, you see? Let's take a look at that. Now, it's not advisable to open up your case after you've done the work with, uh, like, a lot of people around. <laughs> This is the M60 light machine gun. It fires a 7.62 NATO bullet from link belts at a rate of 600 rounds per minute. It's currently in service with U.S. and other nations. Unfortunately, it is a rather poorly designed weapon, for among other reasons, there are a half dozen parts in the M60 which can be installed backwards or upside down. Mistakes just waiting to happen. And as you know, well, in the field, waiting mistakes yeah, do happen. This isn't really the way to shoot it, but... It's I have a lot of fun this way. Gee, this is post ammo letdown. <laughs> a lot of fun. This is the 50 caliber Browning heavy machine gun, the Ma Deuce. It is one of the finest and best designed weapons ever produced. It fires at about 500 rounds per minute. This is a car, which we thought would make a good target for the 50. Have a close look at it. 
This poor car is going to be hit with 100 rounds of 50 caliber ball, tracer, and armor-piercing incendiary bullets. The 50 on its tripod is locked down, so it can't move left to right or up and down. The traverse and the elevation are controlled by dials, so I can adjust. Here we go. Beautiful, beautiful. Last one got him. Now this is dynamite, and dynamite has nothing to do with firearms, but we had another car we had to get rid of, so we thought it might be interesting to see it blown up. Sixteen sticks of 80% dynamite were used, three behind each wheel, and one stick inside next to each door. Let's see that again in stop action. <laughs> 